This will give you an idea of the route we took from Gretna Green to the Orkney Islands. I'll delay the slide for a little while so you can have a look at it. We spent our first night in Edelston, which is about 15 miles south of Edinburgh. The insert is Collie Dean b and where we stayed and we paid £40. Whenever I quote the price of a B&B it's for both of us. We went for an evening drive around the nearby Malden Hills. We came across this Iron Age hill fort and the remains of a stone burial cairn on White Melden. After our drive we had a very nice dinner at the Leadburn Inn. After a nice big breakfast we drove to Falkirk to see the wheel. It's the world's first and only rotating boat lift and it was opened in 2002. I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a minute. We decided to take the boat trip ride aboard Shanks first. It takes you from the Forth and Clyde Canal to the Union Canal. I really wanted to steer Shanks first, but they wouldn't let me. From halfway up you get great views across the countryside and the Port Downey Basin below. It takes about 15 minutes to reach the top. We're now at the top of the wheel and 115 feet above the Forth and Clyde Canal. Unfortunately high winds prevented us from going onto the aqueduct and through the Antonine Tunnel to the upper basin. After the tunnel there's a lock that takes you up to the Union Canal. Each caisson contains 300 tons of water, meaning that the wheel moves 600 tons on each lift. Because they're always in balance, moving them takes surprisingly little power. Up to eight boats can be carried at one time. If you're really interested in learning more about the Falkirk wheel, there's an excellent website you can visit. Our next stop on Tuesday was the gravesite of Rob Roy in the churchyard at Balquidda. And it was here that we got our first introduction to Scotland's famous midges. We had no plans to do the whiskey trail, but as we were close by famous Grouse's Glen Turret Distillery, we decided to check it out. We went on the short tour and that cost £3 each. It included one wee droppy of famous grouse. The tour itself was fairly interesting, but because it was late in the afternoon, all the workers had gone home, so there wasn't a lot of activity going on. I decided not to buy a bottle at Scotland's oldest distillery. 12 year old was 23 pounds and 30 year old was 100 pounds. We ended up at an old Victorian house B&B in Creef. It was called Glen Cairn and it was run by a very friendly young couple. It cost £44. We had dinner and a pint of old speckled hen at the Haggis and Sparren. We got away around 9.30 on Wednesday and our first stop was at Dewar's Aberfeldy Distillery. We didn't go on their tour but we did buy three of their miniatures. We headed east to the small village of Meagal to look for the Picked Stone Museum. Eventually we found it. It's located in an old schoolhouse that is now home to 33 carved Pictish stones dating from the late 8th to the late 10th centuries. Standing almost 8 foot tall, this 9th century stone stood on a grassy knoll known as Venora's Grave. According to local legend, Venora was Queen Genevieve, wife of King Arthur and she'd been abducted by the Pictish King Mordred. She was held captive near Meagle. When she returned to King Arthur after her enforced infidelity, she was sentenced to death, being torn apart by wild beasts. The carving shows a robed figure surrounded by four lions. The curator at this small museum was very informative. It was well worth taking the side trip. In the afternoon we drove through North Perthshire and Kinross in an area known as Glen Shee. This was the Scottish scenery we were looking forward to seeing and the weather was perfect. 
Around lunchtime we stopped for a cup of tea at the Glenshee Ski Centre on Britain's highest main road pass at 2,000 feet. This couple have a spectacular view of the surrounding mountains. In wintertime the chairlift takes skiers nearly to the summit of the Cairnwell and that's at 3,061 foot. By the way, this is a main road in Scotland. It's single track and has laybys. After leaving the summit we continued north towards the Grampian Mountains and the scenery continued to be spectacular. We were a little early for the heather to be out but it was coming into flower in a few areas. We took a smaller road into the town of Braemar. I think this pretty little stone bridge is over the Clooney Water. About 8 miles beyond Braemar in an area known as Royal Teesside is Balmoral Castle and Estate. This is the country home of Her Majesty the Queen. And it is owned and funded by the Queen in her own right, not as the Sovereign. The original Balmoral Castle was purchased by Prince Albert in 1852 and it was replaced with the present castle four years later. When Queen Victoria died in 1901, the estate passed to Edward VII, and then from him to each of his successors. This is the Ice House. At one time it was used to store venison. There are over 2,500 red deer on the estate in winter, and I think that reduces to less than a thousand in the summer. Pat just had to give the Queen a little bit of a helping hand and weed the vegetable garden for her. As you can see the conservatory was overflowing with colourful blooms. The only part of the castle open to the public is the ballroom and the grounds. I guess we spent uh, three hours there. It was definitely well worth the visit. We tried a b and in Bangkori but it had no vacancies. However, the owner insisted on showing us the way to their friend's B&B in Curtin in Duras. It was a homely place run by Gordon and Margaret Leslie and it only cost £36. They suggested we drive into Drum Oak and have dinner at the Irving Arms. And it was a good choice. Very friendly and we had some tasty Scottish salmon for dinner. On Thursday morning we drove 12 miles to the coastal town of Stonehaven in Aberdeenshire. It was only 9.30 in the morning but we liked what we saw so we decided to check into the ship. It was pricey at £75. One reason for visiting this town was because Pat had spent a week or so here when she was about 10 years old. She wanted to see if she could remember anything about it. We couldn't check in until 2 o'clock so went for a drive down the coast road. We found a pretty little harbour at Cataline. These are replicas of the Honours of Scotland, the Crown, the Scepter and the Sword of State. They're made of flowers and kept in St Anthony's Church at Caniff. In the afternoon we went for a walk along the coastal trail. Our destination was Dunatar Castle. It stands on an enormous flat topped rock with sheer cliffs on three sides. Very impressive. We are not great lovers of castle ruins but did enjoy visiting Donatar and finding out about its intriguing history and those honours of Scotland. Here's another shot of Stonehaven that I took on the way back from the castle. We tracked down George, a long time resident, to see if he could remember anything about the family Pat stayed with. She came up here with a Scottish labourer who was staying at her house. Unfortunately George couldn't recall them, but it was still interesting talking to him. We had an early breakfast on Friday morning and got away by 8 o'clock. This is the much photographed Craigivar Castle. We headed north to Nairn on the Murray Firth. From the looks of this beach you'd think we were in the Caribbean, wouldn't you? 
Our main goal was to tour the Highlands, so we decided to skip over Inverness. We crossed over the Murray Forth on the Keswick Bridge and continued our journey northwards. By midday we made it to the Highlands of Easter Ross. This is looking down on Bona Bridge that crosses the Kyle of Sutherland. And this is looking down on Loch Shin. As you can see, traffic's not a big problem on the A836. In the middle of nowhere we came across the rustic 19th century Crask Inn. We decided to stop for an afternoon pint and ended up staying the night there. It cost £64, but that included an evening meal. We highly recommend the Crask Inn, except the evening meal of venison was not that good. In the afternoon I went for a stroll across the nearby moorlands to Loch Bilac. I'm most likely slaughtering all these Scottish names. That one's actually spelled B-H-E-A-L-A-I-C-H. Bilac. I'd guess I walked about six or seven miles. It was easy going, but it got a little boggy in parts. Just had to take a shot of this cow paddy. I'm pointing back to the inn and as you can see, there was a lot of nothing out there. It drizzled most of Saturday morning as we drove along the historically interesting Strathnavar Trail. This area was originally settled in Neolithic times, and that was around 4000 BC to 2500 BC. There are a number of ruined settlements along the trail, this one is Grunmore. In 1814 the Strathnavar settlements were emptied to clear ground for sheep farming, and the stories of the clearances are interesting and tragic. Pat was determined we were going to visit John O'Groats, supposedly the most northern point of mainland Britain. Well, it's not that exciting when you get there, and it really isn't the most northern point. Besides a couple of junky souvenir shops, a small museum and a derelict hotel, there's not a lot to see. However, the admission to the museum is free. John O'Groats is the place where you start or finish if you want to cover the length of Britain by foot, by bicycle, by hopscotching, or pushing a pea with your nose. It's attracted quite a following over the years. The derelict hotel did have a bar, so we popped in for a beer and did a bit of advertising for Jill. No, even though she is a distributor for Miller, we did not have an MGD. We had a Scottish beer called McEwen. Another little white lie. This isn't the last house in Scotland. I know there are some up on Dunnet Head that are definitely further north. Anyway, we ended up getting a and b in the nearby village of Hoona for £34. That was the cheapest we paid in Scotland. After we checked into our B&B, we went for a short drive to Duncansby Head, the most northeastern point of the mainland and a mile or so further from Land's End than John O'Groats. We went for a nice walk along the cliff tops. Someone said there were puffins nesting in this rock cleft, but I couldn't see them. These are the stacks of Duncansby. One more shot from the cliff tops. If you're travelling around this part of Scotland, Dunkersby Head is certainly worth a visit. And like I mentioned, it's a nice stroll from the parking area to the stacks. Next we drove by the 16th century Castle of May. It was purchased by Queen Mum in 1952, shortly after her husband King George VI died. It was late afternoon, so we didn't go around it, but I heard later that it is well worth visiting. As we continued to drive around the area, we came across some Highland cattle. These youngsters were having lots of fun budding heads. Our last stop on Saturday was the real most northern point in mainland Britain, Dunnet Head. 
the military buildings were built during the Second World War to help defend the Navy base at Scapa Flow in the Orkneys. The lighthouse was built in 1832, and despite its lofty position, its windows are often damaged by stones being thrown up by the sea. On Sunday the 24th of July, we decided to travel the single track roads of northeast Scotland. The first place of interest we found was the Great Cairns of Camster. Here are two of the best preserved Neolithic chamber tombs in Britain. They were built more than 5,000 years ago. This one is called Long Cairn and is actually two chambers joined together. What makes them all the more interesting is you can crawl inside the chambers. But it is a bit of a squeeze to get in and out. The forecourt we're standing on was most likely used for ceremonies commemorating the dead. This is the other cairn at Kempster. It's called Round Cairn. Our next stop was Hill of Many Stains. Over 200 small standing stones are set in 22 rows down the side of a hill. And no one knows why they're here or what they were used for. As we headed towards Wick and the coast, we stopped to have a look at another cairn. This one was uncovered. It's called Cairn Get. We walked about half a mile over the hills to get to it. There were some nice views of the surrounding countryside from it. We spent a while there and should have brought a picnic with us. Pat just had to take a shot of this flower pot, man. At one time, the harbour at Libster was a hive of activity. More than 200 boats used to set out to sea from here to catch the silver darlings. They're the herrings. We had lunch in a restaurant called The Mirage in Helmsdale. It was good fish and chips. We then visited the Time Spam Museum. We came back on the single track A897 and that took us by the gold panning country of Bel Anor, and that's Gaelic for Goldfield. We ended up spending a second night at our B&B in Hoona. This shot was taken from the B&B looking across the Pentland Firth to the island of Stroma. It's Monday the 25th and we're off to Orkney. We went over on the Pentland Ferries from Gill to St. Margaret's Hope on South Ronaldsea Island. It takes about one hour and it cost us 50 pounds. This is the uninhabited island of Stroma. These are World War II coastal batteries on Hoax Ahead on South Ronaldsea. We're coming into St. Margaret's Hope and about to start our Orkney adventure. We only visited three of the 70 or so islands in Orkney and they're highlighted on the map in darker green. After we got off the ferry we went to the southeastern corner of South Ronaldsea to look at the Tomb of the Eagles. It's an interesting archaeological site. This is a burnt mound dating back to the Bronze Age, 1800 BC to 600 BC. The owner, Ronald Simerson, explained to Pat how it was used. The large trough in the rear was supposedly used to boil joints of meat. The main attraction at the Tomb of the Eagles is the 5,000 year old chambered cairn. It's a nice walk along the cliff tops to get to it. You have to pull yourself inside by lying on your back on a trolley. Actually it's much easier just to crawl in. Ronald found the cairn by accident while he was working on his farm. The roof's been reinforced to make it safe so you can go inside. Human remains and carcasses of sea eagles were found inside, hence its name. The admission charge of £4.50 includes a hands-on lecture in the small private museum that has some prehistoric artifacts including a Neolithic skull. 
Pad also bought a nice sweater here. We didn't make a B&B reservation on Orkney, even though it suggested you do so. We caught the highly recommended Mill of Ireland from the ferry and lucked out. They had a cancellation, so we booked in for two nights for £100. The converted water mill contains many original features such as grain hoppers and wheel drives. This photo was taken in the lounge. In the evening we went into Stromness for dinner. We ate at the Ferry Inn. The food was okay, but it was noisy. As you can see, the streets of Stromness are quite narrow. Although we arrived at St Margaret's Hope on South Ronaldsea, Stromness is the main ferry terminal for the island, and we'll be leaving from here. By the way, I didn't mention the islands of South Ronaldsea, Bury and Mainland are connected by a causeway called Churchill Barriers. Well, I did say our B&B was highly recommended, and this is why. Besides a nice big breakfast, we had a fresh bowl of fruit and all kinds of marmalades and jams. It was set out very nice. After that excellent breakfast, we set out to explore mainland Orkney. Our first stop was the Stones of Stannis. Originally a circle of 12 standing stones, now there are only 4 left. The reason most people come to Orkney is to visit its well-preserved archaeological sites. Be prepared, you'll be seeing lots of shots of standing stones, cairns, ancient dwellings and brocks. I'll tell you more about them as we go along. This particular stone is about 19 foot tall and one of the tallest on Orkney. These rocks are called a dolmen a prehistoric table or altar. Our next stop was the Ring of Broca. Both Stannis and this side are alongside the road and there is no charge to visit either one of them. The ring has never been fully excavated nor scientifically dated so the monument's age remains uncertain. However, it's generally thought to have been erected somewhere between 2500 BC and 2000 BC. In contrast to the giant megaliths at Stannis, the stones of the Ring of Broca are much smaller and vary in height from 7 foot to this one at 15 foot 3 inches. There are a number of other sites within view from Broca. This is Salt Knoll, and it's just a short walk from the ring. It was a short drive along pleasant country roads to our next stop. No, this is not another archaeological site. It's just an old building and I decided to take a photo of it. Without doubt, the most visited site in Orkney is the Neolithic village of Skara Bray. It was inhabited before the Egyptian pyramids were built and flourished many centuries before construction began at Stonehenge. In the winter of 1850, a large storm stripped the grass off a high dune known as Skara Bray. A large mitten, and that's the refuge heap, was uncovered. And so were the ruins of these ancient dwellings. The floor area of each house is a little less than 400 square feet. Now that's about half the size of a small modern day two bedroom home, so they were quite spacious. All of the dwellings have a hearth in the centre of them, but what did the people burn in them? Peat was not formed in Orkney until several centuries after the settlement was abandoned, and virtually no charcoal has been found in the remains, so wood probably was too precious to burn. They most likely burnt animal dung mixed with dried seaweed and heather and bracken. The furniture was made primarily from stone, and on the left you can see a box bed. Bracken would have been used as a form of mattress and animal skins for blankets. In the centre of the photo is the doorway. The door itself would have been a slab of stone or wood 
and then pinned against the door steps with a bar and this would have been made of wood or possibly whalebone. In each house the dresser faces the door. These are most likely simple storage units but may have been somewhere to keep prized belongings. In the upper centre is a cupboard or alcove recessed into the midden and then stonewalled. Some of these cells have drains running underneath them and they may have been indoor toilets. Because the drains can't be fully mapped without demolishing the structures, it can't be said definitely that every house had one. However, this could be one of the earliest comprehensive systems of indoor sanitation that has been found. This was taken inside a modern replica of one of the houses. The admission fee to Scarabray is six pounds and includes Scale House, which we also had a look around. Mainland Orkney has pleasant countryside, but it's not a place one would come to if they were looking for spectacular scenery. As you can see though, that doesn't mean it isn't pretty. We headed up to Marwick Bay on the north end of the island. Interesting coastline with huge flat slabs of rock going down to the sea. We walked along the beach and shoreline path and after 15 minutes or so found these fishing huts tucked away in San Geo. Geo is a Scottish term for a long deep narrow inlet. At one time fishing boats were pulled up the geo using this winch. Next stop, Earl's Palace in Bursay. Built between 1569 and 1579 by Earl Robert Stuart, an illegitimate son of King James V of Scotland. Its condition today makes it difficult to imagine how the structure would have appeared in its heyday. But it was once an exceptionally fine residence. And this was another one of those places where you didn't have to pay to look at it. At low tide you can walk to this island across a causeway. It's called Bro a Berse. However, it was underwater when we got there. For centuries this tiny island was the political and religious power in Orkney. It was first settled in the 5th century AD but most of the ruins on it date from the Norse period. It's 800 to 1200 AD. Our last archaeological visit of the day was the Brockgurness. That's on the eastern side of the island. A brock is a large Iron Age structure unique to North and West Scotland. Most were constructed and developed between 600 BC and 100 AD. Pat standing at the entrance to the brock. The buildings on either side of the entrance were the village dwellings. I think it only cost us £2.50 each to get in. Very interesting and well worth a fiver. These are the sleeping quarters in one of the dwellings. I know this looks like a loo but I think it's an area to store food in. Originally 26 foot high with a diameter of 65 foot the brock was a tall, easily defended tower and it was surrounded by small dwellings. Actual dates for the brock are unclear but it's generally agreed that it was built somewhere between 200 BC and 100 BC. It was possibly built on the site of an earlier settlement. There are only two towns on mainland, Stromness and the capital, the Royal Borough of Kirkwall. This is the 12th century St. Magnus Cathedral in Kirkwall. I didn't manage to get a very good shot inside the cathedral. John Ray is undoubtedly the greatest of Orkney's unsung heroes. Although his ornately carved memorial lies within the cathedral, very few Orcadians know of the man or his deeds. If you want to know what he did, you'll have to look at my page that tells his story. 
It was late in the afternoon and we were getting a bit tired so we just took a shot at the ruined Bishop's Palace. It was built in the mid 12th century for Bishop William the Old. In the evening we went to the Via House to listen to the Pete Fire Tales of Orkney. It was alright but not one of the highlights of our Orkney visit. It cost £10 each. Tuesday 27th of July. We started making our way back to England. The map gives you an idea of the route we took. I'll give you a few seconds to look at it. We returned on North Link ferries from Stromness to Scrabster, that's near Thurso. It cost £66 and took a little longer than the Pentland ferry crossing, but it was a much nicer vessel. We met this couple while touring around yesterday and went to the Peatfire Towers with them. We passed by the island of Hoy on the way back, and this is its famous 450 foot high rock called the Old Man of Hoy. We headed west on the Northern Coastal Road, the A836, and stopped for a bind at Betty Hill Hotel. Great view at Torresdale Bay. I got some nice shots of Highland cattle as we travelled along Highland's wild north coast. This scenic near island is called Ard Nieik and it's situated on the eastern side of Loch Iribal. This is a deep sea loch and its name comes from the Norse Ir Bal or farm on a beach. The square building you can just make out is an old lime kiln. And this is Loch Iribal from the western side. We arrived in Durness around 4pm to find no vacancy signs at all the B&Bs. We drove back to a B&B we saw on the way in. To our pleasant surprise they had a vacancy. We couldn't have found a better place. It was located in Sanderbeg on a rise above a gorgeous beach. The owners, Joyce and John Morrison, were the friendliest of people. We checked in for two nights for £72. For your information, their telephone number is 01971511719. If you're in that area, it's worth giving them a call. After we got settled in, we took the family dog for a walk along the beach. We even had our own private cave at the far end of the beach and there were some interesting rock formations inside it. We had dinner in a dreary 1940s military building in the nearby Balnakeel Craft Village. On Thursday we decided to start off by exploring Smoo Cave. It's a gaping hole in a sheer limestone cliff that was formed partly by sea action and partly by the small burn that runs through it. You can walk into the main chamber free of charge, but you have to pay £3 to take the two minute dinghy ride into the rear chamber. The rock formations are less memorable than the dinghy ride. A mile or so from Durness along a windy road is Balnakeel Bay. There's not a lot here other than Balnakeel House built in the early 1700s, a nine hole golf course, the ruins of old Durness Church and a beautiful sandy beach. This is the half in and half out tomb of Donald McMurkow. He murdered 18 people for his clan chief. Supposedly he threw them off the cliffs at Smoo Cave. Later in life he gave generously to the church, but the clergy didn't want such an evil man to be buried inside. So this was the compromise they reached with the clan chief. 
It turned into a beautiful sunny day, so we went for a nice hike along the sandy beach to Farade Head. After a mile or so, we left the beach and scrambled up the sand dunes to the headland. Farad Head is a popular walk for bird watchers. There are lots of seabirds, including these puffins. It really was a pleasant walk. I'd guess we covered about five miles. I told Pat it was only two. The Durness Highland Gathering was scheduled for Friday, so we asked Joyce if we could stay on for an extra day. She not only said yes, but offered us the upstairs bedroom with a lovely view. This is the view from our room looking over to Wittenhead on the east side of Loch Iribol. The small island is called Eileen Han. It's Friday and we're off to the Durness Highland Gathering. This is the Ullapool and District Junior Pipe Main. Many of the local clan chiefs attended the gathering. One of the clans travelled quite some distance, and that was the Brennans of Reno. They forgot to bring their kilt and cape, but the clan Mackays came to their rescue. The events went on all day. This was the Highland Dancing Competition. The heavy events included throwing the hammer, and toss in the caber. I think this is a fellow called Ryan Vera from California. He's throwing the 56 pound weight for height. I found out later he'd won the overall heavy events competition. I'm not sure what the name of this event was, but it sure was fun to watch it. Yes, I really did enter the Durness Highland Gathering Tug of War. I invited myself to be a member of the Durness Yobbos, and that's our captain facing the wrong way. But we came in third. However, there were only three teams entered, and the local Durness Whiskers won. They were a bunch of big, burly Scotsmen. It certainly was a fun day and the rain held off. We left Joyce and John's around 9.30 on Saturday and drove through some of the most scenic country we have ever travelled. This is somewhere along the A894 between Laxford Bridge and Carlscoe. This was taken somewhere along the B869 on the Stoa Peninsula. The mountain in the center is the 2,389 foot high Sulven. We got to Ardvrek Castle on Lacassind around 1 p.m. The castle was originally built about 1490. There's not much left of it now, but the walk to it was very enjoyable. There's also some great views from the near island on which it stands. We stopped in Ullapool for a bite to eat. Ullapool is the main ferry port to the Western Isles of Lewis and Harris. We found a B&B in Gairlock. We stayed at Mrs. Dolly Cameron's King Hilly for 36 pounds. Nice lady and a nice view of the lock from our bedroom window. We had dinner at the lock inn. Pat dried their monkfish and I had fish and chips. The meals were okay. Sunday the 31st. After a nice breakfast, we continued our journey along the scenic A869. This is looking across Loch Torridon to the village of the same name. A few miles further on, we turned off the main road onto the unnumbered coastal road that goes around Applecross Peninsula. This is definitely remote but a side trip well worth taking. We arrived at the tiny community of Applecross around noon. We had hoped to get a room at the Applecross Inn, but 
they were full so we had a cup of coffee and continued on our way. We hadn't had any serious problems with the Audi but the next part of our journey was to put it to the test. We had to head inland and over the Bilak Nabar or Pass of the Cattle. The pass rises to 2,053 feet from sea level in about 5 miles. It's considered the most spectacular pass in Scotland. You can see why. We spend about an hour at the summit to let the car cool down and take in the views. That's the Isle of Sky in the background behind us. There's a road sign as you approach the pass that says not advised for learner drivers, very large vehicles or caravans after the first mile. And this is why. At the bottom of the eastern side of the pass is Loch Kisshorn. It's now time for our Isle of Skye adventure. This is the Isle of Skye bridge that crosses the Kyle of Loch Ash and connects the island to the mainland. We spend our first night on the island at Harbour View in Portree, the main town on Skye. The B&B cost £50. It wasn't very good, but once again we had a great view from our bedroom. Monday the 1st of August. After crispy fried eggs for breakfast, we set out to explore the island. And as you can see, traffic congestion was a major problem. Normally there'd be a spectacular waterfall crashing into the sea at Kilt Rock, but the island was having a very dry summer, so there was only a trickle. There are a lot of interesting things to see on Skye, but I think our favourite was the three and a half mile hike to the Quirang on the Trotanish Peninsula. We couldn't have asked for better weather. This shows the trail we took. We started out fairly early, so didn't have a lot of company on the way in. The formation on the right is called the prison. As usual, I had to do my cross country thing. I scrambled up the prison and took the shot of Pat. It got a bit scary, so I didn't go all the way to the top. The three main formations of the Quirang are the needle, that's on the left, the prison, on the right, and the table. We didn't make it to the table because it was a steep scramble up some talus to the left of the needle. This is a better shot of the needle. One last shot from the Quirang. Pat did very good on the hike, especially as there were a couple of spots that were a little interesting to get by. We're still on the Trotanish Peninsula. This is the Sky Museum of Island Life. It's a group of reconstructed thatched black houses that show how the way of life of a crofter was on Sky many years ago. Peat was their main source of fuel, and that's what Pat's holding. The community of Oog is where you pick up the ferry to the Western Isles. Other than the Oog Pottery and the Sky Brewery, where I picked up a couple of bottles of red coolin, there's not a lot else to see. We had a bit of a problem finding digs tonight. All the B&Bs on the Wardenish and Durnish peninsulas were full. We ended up just outside Dunvegan in a modern house and paid £40. We did have a nice view of the coolins in the distance though. It was rainy and drizzly as we said goodbye to the Isle of Skye on Tuesday morning. This is a shot of Red Coolin from Sligagan Hotel. Pat took me on an interesting drive around the congested roads of the Glasgow area as we made our way to our last night in Scotland. This was at the Buchan Guest House in the town of Moffat. Lots of B&Bs here and Buchan was a good choice for £50.